Welcome everybody, my name is Valerie Forbes and I'm the Dean of the Schmidt College of Science and I want to welcome you all to our second Frontiers in Science panel for the semester. Um, you've been seeing the, the slides going by which has the title of tonight's um, panel discussion, How Can the Florida Wildlife Corridor Support Resilience? You will also have seen the map of the corridor which is enormous and we'll be talking about that too. Um, Frontiers is a program run out of the College of Science and it's intended to bring timely topics, uh, timely scientific topics to a broader audience and bring together um, experts to talk about their work and why it's so important and exciting. So in support of our recently launched School of Environmental, Coastal and Ocean Sustainability or ECOS for short of which Colin is our new director, we decided to pick environmental themes for this semester's uh, Frontiers panel discussions. So I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves briefly, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that we're using a phone app called Slido for the questions. Um, there were QR codes in the back, hopefully, and there um, for you to scan. And so you type your questions into the app, and you can, if you don't have a question, but you see a question in there that you like, you can vote it up and it'll move up uh, closer to the top. And we'll have a few minutes for uh, audience Q&A at the end of the panel discussion. Um, so while we would like you to use your phones to ask questions, please turn them on silent so that we don't interrupt any of the panel discussion. Um, and finally, I wanna make sure to invite all of you to join us for a reception uh, next door when we're done with the panel discussion. All right, so with that, I want to welcome our panelists. We have one panelist who is joining us remotely because the legislature is in session and we're very grateful that she is. So I wanna start, there she is. Um, I wanna ask each of our panelists to tell, you, to tell us your name, your current position, your expertise, and since we're talking about wildlife this evening, what is your favorite critter and why? <laughs> and I'm gonna start with Lindsay. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you, and I wish I could see all of your faces. I'm coming to you from Tallahassee at our Capitol. So I have a few roles. I am a state representative from District 60 in Pinellas County, and that includes portions of St. Petersburg and Pinellas Park. I'm also an environmental scientist with a company called ESA. Uh, I've worked in the environmental field for over two decades, 14 years experience at the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, um, a little over six years in nonprofit and now in the public sector. And I would say one of uh, um, the most charming wildlife species we have here in Florida is the Florida scrub jay because it is endemic to Florida and they're just really charming critters. So that's one of my favorites. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. But let's go with you. Next. Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out. It's really an honor to be here. I'm Buck McLaughlin. I'm the range operations officer for Avon Park Air Force Range. I am not an ecologist or scientist. As, as the name implied, I was an Air Force pilot for almost 21 years. My last active duty assignment was the commander of the range and then I had an opportunity to stay on in a government civilian role. Um, and so I'm, I think I'm coming at this panel from a little bit different perspective and hopefully a, a new perspective for some of you to, to look at. I changed like three or four times on the drive here of which animal to pick out of Florida. <laughs> I'm not a Florida native, but the Florida panther is amazing. Um, since Lindsay took the, uh, the, the Florida scrub jay, I was going to go with that one because I'm Air Force and birds and, and, and then also if you ever watch them, they operate in a family group that is very much like a, a patrol, a small platoon. They have sentries, they have scouts, it's just amazing how they operate. But I'm going to go then, since you took that one, I'm going to go with the Florida grasshopper sparrow, one of the most threatened endangered birds in all of North America and through a captive breeding program, we're, we're, looks like we're bringing that bird back. And it is just this really cool little brown bird that lives on the ground in Florida. And so it's got huge challenges, but really a neat species in my, in my book. Excellent, thank you. Josh? 
Very good. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for coming out, and thank you to FAU for hosting us. Uh, it is definitely, as Buck said, a pleasure to be here with you all, and especially with uh, the colleagues that are here with us today. I get the pleasure of working with all of them in different ways throughout the year, uh, especially on the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So uh, I am the Director of Conservation at a place called Archbold Biological Station. And if you haven't heard of us, we are a science, research, education, and conservation facility about two hours inland from here. We are based in rural Highlands County. And uh, as the Director of Conservation for Archbold, I get the privilege of working to take all of our science and turn it into conservation outcomes. Uh, so I'm trained as a biologist, I'm an ecologist, but I now serve mostly as sort of the bridge between scientists and uh, the rest of the world. So how do we take the research that we do at Archbold, the research that our partners, including FAU, um, do on the Florida Wildlife Corridor, on ecosystems, on agriculture in Florida, and turn it into outcomes for a sustainable Florida and uh, beyond. So I, maybe like Buck, struggle to pick one species, uh, but I will go with the uh, eastern indigo snake, which is the longest species of snake native to North America, and they're found only really in the southeast. They're beautiful kind of black, iridescent, almost purple in the right um, color. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a permit to handle them, uh, they are incredibly docile. Uh, you know, some of our also wonderful in other ways snakes, like pine snake might be a little bit bitey if you pick them up. But the indigo snakes are always just sort of inquisitive and cruising around doing their thing. And uh, I really enjoy them. All right, thank you very much, Colin. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, my name is Colin Polsky. I'm on the faculty here at Florida Atlantic University. I'm a climate society uh, researcher and scholar, um, but my day job is, as uh, the dean said, to direct the new school that we're all very proud of here um, that you see advertised on that pop-up banner. The environment school, FAU, finally has an environment school, ECOS, and we're very proud of it. We've always had a lot of talent here in environment, and this is um, uh, the brainchild of the dean and the executive director of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute to launch, and it's really going to allow us to reach new heights. Um, as far as favorite critter, um, so I've been here 10 years now in South Florida, and there was, in the first house I lived in, a uh, constructed wetland. Uh, this was western Broward County. And so it was kind of probably original Everglades, but the developer had to put in some, you know, wetland. And I could see it from the, 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 the windows, and it was gorgeous. There was all sorts of activity all the time. But this one critter caught my attention, the Anhinga, um, because it was doing this odd thing uh, all the time. It was standing facing me with his you know, wings out. And, and I asked, and, and one person said, well, that's because they're uh, feathers are not waterproof, and they fish, and so they have to dry out um, so that the next time they fish, they don't drown. But someone else said, no, they have a low metabolic rate, and they need to absorb more solar radiation and heat up. And so I don't know why they do it, but it's kind of curious, and um, so, so that, that's who sticks with me. All right, the, great. The first one is close. They, they got to dry their wings so they can fly. So uh, not right. drown. Correct. All right. Well, but so they're, they're too heavy above. to fly. <laughs> and Drop. nobody okay. picked the flamingo. Go figure. Okay, <laughs> let's launch into our, our panel discussion. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the link between protected land for wildlife and climate resilience, which is the main theme of, of tonight. So the Florida Wildlife Carter Act was passed in 2021 with unanimous bipartisan support. The law directs the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to encourage and promote investments in areas that protect and enhance the Florida Wildlife Corridor. It specifies that the Florida Wildlife Corridor is an existing physical, geographically defined area comprised of over 18 million acres, of which 10 million acres are protected conservation lands. It was designed to protect natural and working lands from development and help various species adapt to the state's booming human population. The idea we're discussing this evening is that this massive corridor may not just benefit wildlife, but contribute to climate resilience as well. So first question for all of our panelists, what exactly do we mean by climate resilience? 
And can you give us some concrete examples of how protecting land will imp improve climate resilience? So I'm going to start with you, Lindsay. All right. Thank you, Dean, for that question. Um, so when we think of the term resilience, it really means that we have the ability to get back to some stable and desired baseline after stressful or damaging events. Those could be acute events like we're seeing with climate change, or those could be, um, I'm sorry, a, a chronic events like climate change or something acute like um, a major storm or a hurricane. Um, we know that in Florida, we have hurricanes in, in Asia and the um, south of the equator, uh, they experienced typhoons. And I remember reading about uh, in the Philippines, super typhoon high in um, that affected uh, part of that island chain in 2013. And there was actually a small town called General MacArthur that had a an intact mangrove barrier um, system um, around that town. And compared to the town next to it that had removed a lot of its, most of its mangroves, um, the town of General MacArthur was largely saved from damage from that because of its intact mangroves. Uh, the Florida Wildlife Corridor is ju not just land, it also includes some of our aquatic resources um, connecting lands and waters across the state. And so when we look at things like coastal wetlands, emergent wetlands, um, things like mangroves, salt marshes, and, and seagrasses, we know that they have the inherent ability to um, buffer some of the impacts from storms, um, but those plant species, as well as some of the upland species, also have the ability to store carbon from the atmosphere. And carbon is what is increasing uh, the temperatures in our atmosphere and leading to climate change. Um, that actually led to me to sponsor a bill this year related to carbon sequestration, um, where we would task our state with developing a task force to look at some of the value of natural and agricultural lands for storing carbon as well as some of the other ecosystem benefits that they provide. Um, we know that when we're transitioning lands from natural or some type of working landscape like cattle ranching or timber, we are increasing runoff, we're increasing pollution. A lot of the times we're seeing increased water and air temperatures. Um, and we're also losing the, those features such as the ability of wetlands to store, um, store water to support our aquifer, as well as reduce some of the flooding uh, to downstream areas. And so I think uh, the resilience that we have in both the terrestrial and the aquatic portions of the Florida Wildlife Corridor is first trying to um, mitigate some of the damage from our human activities, uh, but also support so many of the other ecosystem services that allow us to, um, to survive in this state and on this planet. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, other perspectives, examples of how the corridor contributes to climate resilience? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so I can speak a little bit from the, the wildlife perspective of climate resilience. And uh, it, Lindsay gave a great definition. Certainly we as biologists also think about resilience as the ability of a system to bounce back after a disturbance or to resist some level of change in the face of a disturbance. And so for wildlife that might be if we're thinking about a threatened or an endangered species, uh, what happens to its population in the face of some disturbance, like it could be a wildfire, it could be a storm, it could be one of these slower disturbances like growing heat or sea level rise or even saltwater intrusion, the movement of seawater into freshwater ecosystems like is happening in, um, in our uh, southernmost part of the state in the Everglades. Uh, so conserving the Florida Wildlife Corridor builds some resilience for these wildlife species because it allows them to sort of make up their own mind and find the places that are uh, still available to, uh, to these species as habitat. So one of the best understood principles in ecology is what's called island biogeography. And it was actually developed in large part here in Florida. Um, and uh, the idea is that smaller islands and more isolated islands have fewer species in them and the populations of those species persist less long in those places. It applies not just to oceanic islands, but also to terrestrial islands of habitat within a sea of development. And so we can extend, and biologists do extend that idea from islands in the sea to islands, like I said, of isolated habitats as we develop around them. And if we can connect and protect the Florida Wildlife Corridor, it allows those islands to be bigger, 
It allows places to not even be islands, and uh, wildlife are able to persist uh, in the face of climate change and other disturbances. Okay, thank you. Buck, you want to add a perspective? Yeah, just, just quickly from a, um, from a DOD, from an Air Force perspective, uh, we, we share that definition of resilience that Lindsay put out. Uh, but would also add, it's also the ability to operate through and during an acute event. And one of the things that allows the Air Force to do that is our infrastructure. And it's easy to focus in on the man-made infrastructure when you're thinking about runways or buildings or things like that. But a big part of that is the natural infrastructure because that again, is, as has been presented, is the more resilient piece of that in, in my opinion. I think a lot of times we as human beings think we can better design nature and nature comes back and reminds us hmm. time after time again that they've got a pretty darn good solution out there and we need to work with it. So from an insulation perspective, how do we continue our mission both through an acute event and, and of course afterwards? And it is a big part of that is that natural infrastructure. Okay, great, thank you. Come on. Yeah, I'd like to add, um, challenge my colleagues here. Uh, one of the concepts uh, in resilience from a social science perspective has been not just the ability to make it through challenging events or to bounce back, those are important, but to be better off after. So it's this notion, um, I defined it once as climate resilience is the ability to prosper in the face of climate adversity. And the prosper is just the key word to make sure we don't forget that we don't want to build back to how it was necessarily, maybe in some cases, but in some cases, that prior setup was what led to the weakness in the first place. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I want to change themes now and talk about stakeholder collaboration. And Lindsay, this is primarily a question for you. So collaboration is a key word, perhaps the key word, um, in the Carter's success. There are federal, state, and local entities that are involved. For example, there's Florida Forever, Rural and Family Lands Protection Program, and many, many others. Um, also, there are several collaborative teams that have been established under the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation, a solar energy team, a compatible trails team, and a compatible communities team. So, Lindsay, can you talk about why having so many players involved and working together is so important. And in your experience, some of the challenges involved in keeping these diverse groups of stakeholders all working toward common goals. Yeah, um, great question, Dean, thank you. So, you know, as, as you've mentioned, the Florida wildlife border is 18 million acres, which is hard for some of us to, to fathom. And it does include a network of federal, state, and local lands, as well as private easements on working lands or just um, pieces of land that have been in someone's um, in someone's family for many years that they want to put some protection over. So just from that perspective, um, it is a very, it's a very complex structure between the local state and federal, um, how all of those things literally create this network, this mosaic of lands. Um, and the corridor has been in an evolving process. So, um, there's collaboration, first of all, from the scientific perspective, because the idea of the corridor came from some scientists at the University of Florida, Dr. Tom Hochter, um, under their geo, I think, geo program, um, and some some individuals um, at FNA who looked at this as a concept um, of creating not islands but connected areas. So. For something like this to be successful, it has to be rooted in science, and we have to be able to to talk about why it's valid. Some of the things that that Josh mentioned, um, but the corridor, the vision for it, um, in addition to being having a scientific and a wildlife um, focus, was made possible because of um, the founder of the organization, Carlton Ward Jr., who is a wildlife photographer. He's a conservation photographer. He is now um, a National Geographic Fellow. And so the organization that he founded was not the Florida Wildlife Corridor, is the Legacy Institute for Nature and Culture. And this idea of an expedition and showing people what these natural lands look like and the wildlife that inhabits it, and really just the, uh, the magic in these places, 
um, was because of the ability to, to bring an artistic view to it and to use art, to use photography, um, now to use, um, you know, so many different, different mediums to expose people to this. Um, so the corridor is not just about land, you know, in addition to that, it's about, it's about food security. It's about working with farmers to develop easements that allow them to continue to do their practices, but to put protections on the land. It's about water quality. So some of the things that happen on the corridor are helping um, local municipalities potentially meet some of their water quality requirements with TMDLs or looking at how the corridor can can hold and store water on there. Um, it's also about public recreation. So whether you're a sportsman, an angler, or someone just who likes to go out hiking and bring their families there, um, that's what the corridor is about as well. And so bringing in all of these voices means that there is more engagement and there's uh, becomes a unified voice in all of this. Um, the corridor in recent years, I think, has been really successful because it's been a strategic vision for conservation. And again, it's focused on this geographic area, 18 million acres of the state. Um, but because of that, it does exclude some partners within all of these different sectors that I've, that I've talked about. For example, if you are a statewide land protection organization, or you're one that operates in a part of the state that is not part of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, uh, there was some difficulty at times getting buy-in, getting support from some of those organizations, or finding ways for them to maybe not change their mission, but to begin to focus on some of the protections within the corridor itself. And so that means that at times some people have been left out uh, because they don't fit into the corridor. Um, some of the things that you mentioned, Florida Forever and the Rural and Family Lands Protection Program, those are funding at the uh, funding programs at the state level from either Department of Environmental Protection or Department of Ag. And just because they're subject to, um, to our budget process here in Tallahassee, it means that sometimes programs get funded one year, sometimes they get funded another year. And so again, there's winners and losers. If a, if a program or a piece of land is on the Florida Forever list, it may get funded one year where something that's on the Rural and Family Lands Protection Program may have to wait until, until there's funding. Um, but by having this unified vision, um, it does allow people the flexibility, I think, to be as engaged as they want to be. I think people have seen that having a strategic vision has led to more excitement about conservation. It has certainly led to a commitment from the Florida legislature not just by passing the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act, by, but by putting uh, significantly more money into these conservation programs in the tunes of um, you know, almost a billion dollars or a little more than a billion dollars um, in funding last year. And so um, that, that didn't happen because just one person had an idea that benefited them in their region, but because they could show that uh, protecting the corridor does support, support artists, it supports food security and water quality, it supports public recreation and our sportsmen's community, and it is based in science and the right thing to do. Thank you, thank you, that's great. So I wanna make sure we get to all our themes, so I wanna move on to the, the next topic, and that is the role of the military. Um, so Buck, probably most people don't immediately think of conservation when they think of the Department of Defense or the military. Yet the Avon Park Air Force Range is an incredibly uh, important partner in the corridor collaboration, and your operation has been particularly involved in um, prescribed burning operations. So I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, what the military's interest is in land conservation in general, and then more specifically, why prescribed burning is such an important tool in this regard. Yes, yeah, certainly uh, appreciate that opportunity. Lindsay queued it up perfectly for me again. I, will, uh, I stole this quote from, from Carlton Ward. And if you're not familiar with him, one of his biggest uh, productions recently was Path of the Panther. And if you haven't seen that, it's streamable on Disney Plus, just an incredible movie. It really is, really is good. Um, 
but Carlton phrased that there is surprising synergy between the Department of Defense mission and the natural environment and, and wildlife. And maybe another way of thinking of that is that the military, in order to do its mission, and, and particularly for Avon Park Air Force Range, we are a training installation. We're, we're a bombing range. And so our, our men and women in our, our military need that freedom of maneuver to train like they fight. Well, that's the same freedom of maneuver that the wildlife depends on so much. So right there we have a common interest. And where that collaboration really comes home is that while our authority kind of stops and ends, the federal authority ends at the fence line of federal property, <coughs> our interests and our effects go well beyond that fence line. And once again, the, the, the wildlife doesn't really know. They can't read the signs saying this is a restricted area of bombing range, stay, stay out. So we have to manage for those species, and we do it best when we do it outside the fence line as well as inside the fence line. And those programs that Lindsay mentioned, uh, particularly Florida Forever and the Rule and Family Lands Protections, those are state programs that we partner with through the, the Federal Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program. And that is federal money that can be used as a match for those programs. So we collaborate with conservation agencies, local governments, to try to identify willing landowners who will sell some of their development rights in the form of a conservation easement. And what that does for the military, that allows us to keep that compatible land use off base. I've not received a single noise complaint from cows to date. <laughs> and so we want to encourage that and, and be a part of the community in terms of supporting that agricultural economic uh, function within the community and that landowner, again, a voluntary program where they, they sell off those, uh, those development rights. As part of keeping compatible land use around the installation, not just for the mission and, and for noise and uh, vibrations off of bombing and things like that. It is also because one of our best tools, as, uh, as Dean introduced there, was is that prescribed fire. And this has been fascinating to me to come, I was born and raised in Colorado, and fire is bad out there. We don't like fire for the most part uh, because we haven't managed it well, in my opinion. But here in Florida, there's just, it was incredible for me to learn how many species and how important of a land management tool prescribed fire is. And it's really hard to burn when you're smoking out your neighbor. So that compatible land use that allows the mission to operate also creates the space for smoke sheds. You've, you've heard of the sound of freedom. Our environmental flight chief is trying to coin the phrase the smoke of freedom. <laughs> and as such, Avon Park, and again, when I tell people I work at a bombing range, you can see the mental image of forming of smoking craters, and I promise you, if you get the opportunity to go out there, and we have a big recreation program, it is, it is some of the most pristine natural Florida habitat, because through fire, through a prescribed burn program, or through accidental fires, either natural lightning caused, or ordinance caused, we start a lot of fires when we're, we're dropping bombs out there, um, that burns the range about a third of the range burns every year, and as I understand it, that was a pace that nature burned this area before we moved in and put up all the impediments to fire. So you really have areas where we concentrate, small areas where we concentrate the military mission on, but the rest of the areas, these safety buffer areas, these smoke sheds, are really some of the most natural, pristine habitat. And there's that intersection of, of um, common objectives that Again, I think it is a little bit surprising. Mm, yeah, but important. Okay, and I know Josh, you've been involved with some of the prescribed burning stuff as well. But I want to, I want to get ask you about data and sure. the importance of long-term data, uh, because certainly making informed decisions about species and land management is is requires good data. Right? And the data have to be collected over relevant spatial and temporal scales. They have to be curated. They have to be made available so that interested stakeholders can access them and work with them. And Archibald Biological Station has been collecting and managing many different types of long-term data for many, many years, well before the corridor was a, a thing. 
Um, and you've been personally involved in developing a new database as part of the Carter efforts. So in your view, I'd like to ask, what are some of the most important types of data needed in relation to the Carter specifically? And what kinds of concerns do you have related to managing such data? Thank you. I uh, appreciate the question. I'm going to take panelist prerogative and do 30 seconds to follow up on the question Fine. to Buck <laughs> because I want to um, say thank you for opening my eyes to what a partner the Department of Defense can be uh, in the three years that I've been in this position. And, and actually, Buck and I together have a, a new grant from the, the Department of Defense uh, that will enable regional burning team. We're going to have a team of three folks for at least three years who will be burning um, natural habitats and private area, uh, private landowners' uh, areas with their permission, of course, uh, around the bombing range to reduce wildfire risk and help them continue their operations while maintaining habitat for wildlife in the corridor and beyond. So um, it's a really cool collaboration and a fun one for me. Um, on the data side, mm -hmm. we are all about long-term data at Archbold. Um, we have been collecting it ourselves for 82 years now, and uh, we actually have long-term weather data that go back about 100 years because the previous site owner uh, was actually collecting it himself as well. So uh, we are sort of all about it because it helps us track the trends in the wildlife and ecosystems that we're so interested in and that uh, we try to serve our data to protect. So uh, a couple of examples. I mentioned the weather data. Uh, we also have probably some of the world's best long-term data sets on uh, individual species and how they persist or decline in, uh, in natural ecosystems. So for instance, our previous plant ecologist, Eric Mangus, and now our current one, Aaron David, have been studying some of the world's rarest plants that only are known from six or 10 or 12 places in the whole world, all of them right around Archbold. And uh, those data are then used to build models, mathematical formulations for how we understand rare species around the world. So the ability and the freedom to develop the science needed uh, for really long-term, really fine-scale data sets um, doesn't come from very many places. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if I can toot our horn a little bit, Archbold gives scientists the, that freedom, that ability to focus on just a small number of species or a small number of questions for a very long period of time, unlike many, um, many even universities. Uh, where there's, there's often pressure to teach or pressure to get the next big grant. Um, so we see long-term data as key for understanding climate change, key for understanding the impacts of other, um, other disturbances and, and threats to wildlife. And then you mentioned one particular data set, which I think has the potential to become a really neat long-term one. Uh, we've been working with the Central Florida Regional Planning Council, which is one of 10 regional planning councils around the state. And these are semi-governmental agencies that are tasked with uh, providing planning capacity to all of our counties. So they're really well versed in land use planning, in zoning, in local economics and municipal funding. And uh, as the corridor campaign was kind of getting up to speed, we at Archbold went to our local planning council and said, hey, it'd be really helpful to know where buildings are planned. Where is development going to happen? All of those data exist because if you want to go build a building, you have to go to your local planning department and say, I need a permit, I need you know, endangered species permits, I need to know if there's going to be water available at the site and so forth. Um, but they're dispersed in our 67 counties and in hundreds of individual municipalities. And it was really difficult to understand the holistic picture, which is really key to a large statewide wildlife conservation plan. If you only know what's happening in your town or in your part of town even, how do you start to prioritize among 18 million acres or even the 8 million acres that haven't been conserved yet? So we sent the planning council off and they did seven, the, they did, um, excuse me, they did seven counties right around Archbold, the Heartland region of Florida, and came back and we said, you guys did a great job. How about you go do the other 60 counties? <laughs> and they sort of groaned and said, well, that was kind of a pain, but we see the value. And they did a fantastic job. Uh, we got about 85% of municipalities in the state to respond. And uh, they turned up you know, a sort of frightening number of building permits. 454,000 building permits were issued in the state, in just 85% of the state, between 2019 and 2022. So one of the 
the challenge is now is how do we use that data? And then especially, you asked about managing it, how do we keep it relevant and current? So they just spent a year collecting four years worth of data. And uh, that was funded uh, by one of our partners, the Live Wildly Foundation, uh, who've been a big supporter of the Corridor campaign and, and Archbold in particular. Um, if there's anyone who's really sort of a techie person in the audience, maybe a student, who wants to tell me how we scrape the databases that exist at all of our counties and keep this current, please come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> because that would be hugely beneficial to the Florida conservation community. Um, that's just one example. We're also working with the National Science Foundation to manage 200 terabytes a year of wildlife camera imagery and sound uh, recordings from the corridor. So it, the list is long, um, but it is all about, uh, again, partnerships actually on the science side as well. Yeah, that's great. That's a tremendous source of information. And, and if I could chime yeah, in to, uh, to return the favor with Josh, we, the, the range contracts with Archibald Biological Station to do the majority of our threatened endangered species monitoring. So the, the scientists who are working with that Florida grasshopper sparrow that I was talking about, those are Archibald employees that work with the range and we couldn't do our job without them. All right, so I want to switch gears again and talk about trade-offs and public perceptions. And Colin, I want to start with you. Um, so it, it seems that the, the Wildlife Corridor Act is an effort to balance the competing needs of land for conservation and species protection, agriculture, recreation, and population growth. And financial incentives, such as Buck, you mentioned the conservation easements, and wetland mitigation banking is another tool. Um, that these kinds of tools are used to balance among the trade-offs. Given the vast amount of land involved, it would seem essential that the Carter has broad and continued public support. So Colin, you've worked a lot on public perceptions related to climate change. Can you talk about the kinds of factors that influence the public's perceptions of things like climate resilience and whether they're likely to be supportive or not of initiatives such as the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And since this is going to be a long-term effort, how do we keep the public engaged and supportive? Great, well, I'm gonna um, take a page from Josh's book and take a panelist's prerogative just for a moment. <laughs> People and, aren't behaving tonight, what's going uh, on? <laughs> you know, independent academic thinking. But um, very briefly, if you Google, not now, but uh, Wildlife Corridor or Florida Wildlife Corridor, you will see a vast amount of information and a handful, perhaps a larger number of examples, of which the Florida Wildlife Corridor is one. Um, what's interesting about the collaboration and the, the theme of this uh, event that you've convened, but the collaboration that we have at FAU with Archibald Biological Station is we're adding in the perspective of climate change, climate resilience. And so that is not what you'll find if you Google um, uh, wildlife corridors and, and conservation efforts. So to link to fire and prescribed burning, um, this is something that's really interesting. And so what we know from the climate change perspective is that in general, but in Florida in particular, we expect fire risk to increase in the coming decades. Um, so that's just gonna happen whether there's a Florida wildlife corridor or not. And so we could go on and on here or later or in, you know, write about it, but that is a very interesting one climate dimension to keep our eyes on as we continue to think about the wildlife corridor, where specifically if we can per conserve more acres, we will have uh, the direct ability to lower our fire risk, which is going up independent of us. So I just wanted to make that connection, and that's something very, I think, um, novel and helpful that we're, we're starting a collaboration on climate change uh, perceptions and public interest let me just share with you two numbers um, that will help answer this question uh, 115 and 40 and this is from from our staff today help me realize this 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 legislation passed in July of 2021 in the state of Florida by a vote of 115 to 0 in the state house and 40 to zero in the state Senate. Let me ask you to reflect and tell me if you know an answer, an example, because I don't. The last time you heard of a bill that it was in, of any consequence materially that passed unanimously in any state legislature. 
I don't know of any. And so this particular topic, for some reason, and I think one of the big credits is to a group called Live Wildly, but how they were able, or anyone was able, to actually get unanimous support is beyond me. But it's a story that needs to be told. So yes, there are competing interests. Uh, land conservation at the parcel level, the, the individual landowner, um, all the way up through municipal governments and nonprofits and, and so on. And uh, for some reason, this idea has a lot of appeal and a lot of traction in Florida. So um, my, my sense is that it has as good a chance of continuing to succeed as it has already demonstrated as any other topic I can, I can think of in, in the environment uh, domain especially in Florida. And to answer your question, what is needed, uh, what I've been turning to in, in my research and teaching is trust. And I know that might sound kind of glib, but it's, um, this country's become rather polarized in, in uh, recent years. And it's not just a partisan thing, but you know, sometimes that's a good proxy for understanding it, but it's, it's more than that. And um, trust is, is something that's essential. And that, again, that might sound glib, but it, we have to preserve that. Somehow it seems to be there as evidenced by the votes, as I already alluded to. That could um, vanish tomorrow, I think, if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, hopefully that's helpful. Yep, okay, thank you. Um, do any of our other panelists want to take a panelist prerogative and <laughs> add to? She does. <laughs> Lindsay, yes, please. Yeah, so I, I'd like to build on what uh, Dr. Polsky said. And I think one of the reasons why the Florida Wildlife Corridor has been so successful is because, you know, and this is, um, rooted in, in trust, but it's a good product. We know it's based in science. Um, there's validity to this idea, the strategic vision. There's been a good message um, that connecting lands in a strategic way is best for our state, that'll support our water, our wildlife, and our way of life. And there's been a good messenger. And so every person speaking on this panel is in some way a messenger for the Florida Wildlife Corridor, but also the tools used to reach uh, the public in in creative ways through expeditions, through photography, through videos like Path of the Panther. All of those things were necessary to get the Florida Wildlife Corridor to have a bipartisan unanimous bill and to get the type of record funding. So if you're missing any of those things, if it's not a good product, you don't have a good message or you don't have a good messenger, you're not gonna be successful in the way that the Florida Wildlife Corridor has been. Okay, thank you, thank you. Any, anybody, yes, yeah, Josh? Yeah, I'll, I'll add um, one bit to this question of why it's so successful as well, I think, and then maybe a challenge for everybody here. Um, I think it's an intuitive vision in some ways. There's a map, you can look at it, and you understand it's connected, and that's kind of the point. And um, it touches almost everyone. So if you're into wildlife, that's an easy win. If you're into fishing and hunting, that's a pretty easy win. If you're a rancher, we're talking about paying you to keep being a rancher. Uh, if you're uh, uh, the military, we've heard all about that. So I think it's an unusually um, well-messaged, as Lindsay said, kind of win-win-win-win for everybody in Florida. Uh, it's also a win for people who, who moved here because they like the natural lands that, that are in Florida. It touches a lot of beaches in the panhandle. Um, so there's a lot of things that a lot of people can get out of corridor success. Uh, my challenge, I think, for everybody in the room would be, if you like this vision, now you understand the big picture. The nitty gritty is where it hits the, ro uh, the rubber hits the road. And local planning decisions matter. So what zoning changes are happening where you live? Uh, what developments are happening where you live? And what conservation is happening where you live? And uh, it, I promise you, does matter if you speak up about those things. I see it around Archbold. Uh, when I go to county commission meetings, and Buck goes to these as well. Um, so absolutely, you know, there's opportunity for everyone to be involved. Okay, did you want to add anything to that? You don't have to, but you can. Uh, you know, just as Josh was, was talking, and, and uh, Colin as well, and, and Lindsay too, um, it also, to me, ties back to that idea of resilience uh, and the natural infrastructure that supports us all. 
Um, I haven't looked at the numbers real recently, but within the last couple of years through the Florida Chamber, 1,000 to maybe even 1,500 people are moving to Florida per day. And so from a natural resources standpoint, and we can focus on water, water quality and quantity, that's going to be a challenge going to forward as we add more people. And if we don't protect those natural resources, that natural infrastructure that feeds the aquifer, we're not going to have enough fresh water. And that, that affects a military installation in the same way it affects a neighborhood, a city, uh, you know, a small city, big city, uh, all of us. So I hope, or my, my sense is, that there's that connection between the public and the Florida Wildlife Corridor that this is going to help us all. Great. Thank you. I think that's a good note on which to turn over to the audience Q&A. And I have a long list of questions that have been put into Slido. Um, so I'm going to start. And whoever wants to answer can answer. So the first question is, and it says, what actions do you hope that stakeholders will take upon receipt of this important report? And I don't think anyone mentioned the report. Uh, but this maybe it, this is a good opportunity to mention a report that will be coming out. And what do we want stakeholders to, to do once they get it? Well, we're writing a report. <laughs> uh, we were very lucky to be approached by Archibald Biological Station, and Jay Baldwin and I have had the pleasure of leading this effort, and it's wrapping up in about a week. Um, so we'll release it in the coming month or so uh, publicly. And it is uh, on this topic of the intersection between climate, uh, the Florida Wildlife Corridor and climate resilience. And so um, w the, uh, what, what would stakeholders, what might they do? Yes. Um, I'd look at the, the high points of, of the um, report and um, think through. So I'll, I'll one, you know, think about fire risk uh, that we just referenced. Um, that may not be something that anyone here thinks about on a regular basis because we do a pretty good job of protecting our cities uh, from fire, but it's something that's going to be harder to do uh, because of the changing climate and because of the thousand people a day, unless the way we configure our landscapes is um, managed. Um, and so, so that's one. Um, increasing fire risk and a kind of a flip side of that is increasing flood risk and that is something we could have had an entire conversation tonight just about that yeah. with no reference to the corridor or the concept of uh, land conservation and Florida just happens to be one of the <laughs> leading places for for that so we're kind of you know a lot of fun stuff happening here in in Florida um, so so yeah pay attention if you would to I would say three things, fire risk, uh, flood risk, and then this other notion is we showed a map um, earlier, and, and my bet is a good share of the audience had not heard of the corridor before coming tonight. Um, Google for the map. Look at this map. It is a tremendous, it spans, it's 18 million acres, almost the entirety of the state, or touches you know, all the regions, most of it. Um, and yet, there's a couple of choke points, maybe two or three, such that without particular attention to those parts, what we might end up with is not one corridor, but two or three corridors that are isolated from each other. Mm -hmm. And so that adds urgency, I would say, as kind of an outsider, to prioritizing where within the vast state uh, to prioritize geographically, maybe at those choke points. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a great answer. Um, thank you for explaining the report and thank you for your work on it. Um, the, the question started with what would we want stakeholders to do? Yes. And uh, stakeholders can mean lots of things. I think of three in particular maybe. Uh, landowners who have land that might be conserved. Uh, the rest of the conservation community, which is land trusts and agencies. Uh, and uh, decision makers, which is maybe local and state and federal uh, government officials. And one thing that they can all do, and what you can suggest that they do if you know any of these people, is go look for funding. Because we are flush with conservation funding in this world right now. We are living in sort of an unusual stretch of three or four or five years 
thanks to uh, a, a, a pair of federal bills uh, which have found their way to Florida funding. And there is money for landowners. There is money for state agencies. There's money for local agencies. Whether you're looking to plan for resilience or conserve land, uh, or looking at water quality or agriculture. Uh, actually, one of the initiatives that Buck and I work on, it's called the Sentinel Landscape, all about um, resilience of environmental lands around the bombing range. We struggle to have enough people to write grants for all this money. Uh, so if you or someone you work with is able to do that, it's a huge opportunity and it will not last forever. Mm. That's a good, good point. Good point. And I'd like yeah. to chime in just quickly yeah. too. As uh, I, I consider everyone in this room stakeholders. So I would encourage you to get out into the, into the wildlife corridor. Go see it. It's beautiful. Put it on your social media. Know about it when you go to that planning commission meeting where they're talking about changes to comprehensive plan and zoning. And, and let them know that we have this incredible resource and really this incredible opportunity uh, that a lot of other states don't have. I'm, I don't know many other, and if, that, if in any at all, that have come together in a bipartisan manner that passed an act like the Florida Wildlife Corridor. No other state has this, so this is an opportunity for all of us. Let's, let's seize that. So there's a related question here that I want to take now because it follows on nicely from this discussion is, what are, you, you talked people about people getting out there to see it and appreciate it, but are there any roles for citizen scientists in any of this work for people to get engaged that way? I can jump in quickly on a personal experience. Uh, um, there was a proposed development that would have affected the mission of the range, taking away a bunch of our airspace called Destiny. And it was gonna be this eco-sustainable 100,000 person city. And it is now the, Deluca Wildlife Preserve, or biology, I'm not, probably not saying that. Preserve, yeah. De Deluca Preserve. And they do a thing, uh, and you'll have to help me on this, uh, what is it called, Josh? The, the uh, bio blitz. The bio blitz. You do a bio blitz where you can get out on the property, and it's an app you download on your phone. You take pictures of, of plants. We, the, the ones I've done are, have been plant based, and just all the cool little flowers and stuff you see you're out there helping to catalog the biodiversity of that property. And for me, and again, a non-scientist, it was so much fun. I'm crawling around in weeds trying to find little flowers and stuff, and I probably took pictures of a bunch of dandelions, and there's, but, but it all feeds into this app, and then real scientists get that information and can catalog that. So that's one just example of, of opportunities. Yeah, so, that's a great example, and even without going to DeLuca, you can participate in something similar. The app that they use for those bio blitzes is called iNaturalist. Some of you may have come across it, and, and we actually helped get the Florida Wildlife Corridor added as, an, as a recognized area on iNaturalist. So wherever you are in the corridor, you can mark the species that you're seeing, and um, that becomes available to scientists for, uh, for analysis. I will also say um, I brought a couple of postcards, and I'll have them at the um, the session afterwards with links to Archbold's website. And we do have uh, science events. Again, we're only about two hours from here. It makes a great day trip. Uh, we do have public open science events. And uh, we do sometimes have citizen science events where we're actually looking for people to help collect data. Okay, great. Well, let's go to another audience question. Um, are there key animals that we're looking forward to see if our climate resilience is improving or declining? Okay. Uh, I'll give a go. Um, so if, I think if the question is really asking, like what are the sentinel species, yeah. the ones that are um, the canaries in the coal mine yeah. for climate change? Um, interestingly, in Florida, we don't see a really strong signature of too many native species that are moving north the way we do in a lot of the rest of North America and a lot of other temperate and uh, boreal regions towards the poles. Uh, what we do see is some invasive species like pythons, uh, tegus to some extent, an invasive lizard uh, that are moving north. So that's one to keep an eye on. And then we see some ecosystems, particularly coastal ones that are moving north as well. So mangroves would be the key example here uh, and kind of a two-edged sword. Good thing for mangroves that they're able to adapt and move north. Not so good thing for the, replace, the, the ecosystems that are being replaced, in particular salt marsh. So we're losing salt marsh, which has its own set of species and its own set of ecosystem services that we, that we benefit from. 
we are in places gaining mang mangroves, um, so hard to say there. Florida panther would also be one to point to. They are predicted to lose a chunk of their habitat down in the Everglades area uh, due to encroaching uh, seawater with sea level rise. Parts of the Everglades will become wetter and uh, saltier. It'll change the vegetation there. So those would be a couple examples. Okay. Anybody else? I don't want to forget you about Lindsay. Okay, you're good. Let me go to the next question. Um, it seems that Florida's highways would be one of the biggest challenges to wildlife corridors. Is the Florida Department of Transportation actively working with environmentalists? I guess, how is, how is that in the corridor work? Lindsay. All right, so I'll take this question. And, and there are certainly ways that Department of Transportation, DOT, has been working um, with the corridor. There are places where there, there's just going to be a road. Um, and in many cases, DOT is now putting in underpasses or in some cases are maybe overpasses. And so they're trying to anticipate, usually using data um, where they're seeing wildlife, particularly panthers and, and other highly mobile species. And so they're able to, to put in these underpasses. Usually these cost, you know, a million dollars or more. So it's not an insignificant cost, but it is helping to uh, protect wildlife and um, human, you know, human life on these roadways. So that is a place where, where DOT has been a partner. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a bill by the then Senate president uh, that would create a new network of three new toll roads across the state called the M cores, the multi-use multi-use um, regional corridors of economic uh, significance. And that would have um, had an impact on an estimated uh, 10,000 acres of natural and agricultural lands. If those uh, three toll roads had been built, one of them would have gone through prime um, panther habitat in Southwest Florida, going right through portions of the Everglades and the Big Cypress. And I was working as um, doing public lands work for a nonprofit at that time and actually helped to start a coalition of over 100 um, organizations and business businesses that opposed those roads. And through a lot of opposition, um, we were essentially able to, to stop that project, which was a Senate president priority um, because we could demonstrate um, how bad it was for for our water, for our food supply, for our wildlife. And in many cases, they, there just was not the need for this new road infrastructure. Okay, great, thank you. So, can, yeah, go ahead. I, and I can give a quick example on that to, to Lindsay's point. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, there is one of these uh, wildlife underpasses being put in on uh, I-4 between Tampa and Orlando. And the innovative piece from my perspective is that the, the work started as, an, as a new exit overpass exchange for, for humans and cars. Uh, but they were able to, as part of that work, expand that, uh, since they're already tearing up the road and doing the construction, they were able to add that wildlife corridor as part of that. And I think that's an innovative model that if you're gonna be doing work on the road anyways, let's, let's slap that, uh, you know, that underpass in there along with it. Um, a, a brief addition, um, I want to add the climate link here again, and um, in the Everglades or near there is a, a road called the Tamiami Trail, and in recent years there was an effort to try and allow, do something to allow the water to flow as it used to naturally north to south and um, reduce some of the flood risk in the northern parts. and. Uh, rewater some of the southern parts. So the technologies, and, and that's been done a little bit, like a few miles. It's very expensive and it took uh, many years because there's a lot of permitting and a lot of conversations that have to happen. Um, but whether it's the passageways under the roads for the animals or elevating road to let water flow, it, the t the it's not high tech, but it's not cheap. Thank you all. That um, we have to stop there. There are a lot more questions that have come in, um, but there will also be an opportunity to speak with our panelists um, at the reception afterwards. 
I would like to ask all of our experts for joining us tonight and providing your perspectives. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank our folks who helped make this uh, event happen, Brittany Bonner, uh, Zach Greathouse, the team from uh, Center of Environmental Studies, Student Union people, all of you helped uh, behind the scenes and on the scene to help make this all work. So thank you very much. Thank you to our audience. Um, if you missed our first panel, which was about a month ago, on what's happening to water quality in Florida, we video recorded it, so it's available on the College of Science website. Uh, we also, I can give a shout out for another event that's happening April 12th during the middle of the day, which is the Science Fest, which um, a lot of our students and programs at the university uh, will be set up in the breezeway to sort of do a little show and tell. We've got a student poster competition uh, where they present their research and a lot of middle school and high school kids will be there um, with lots of energy. So it is open to the public. Uh, please uh, come and enjoy. And now, um, thank you and join us next door for some drinks and snacks. Thank you all. Thank you so much.